everyone, and welcome to our second episode of the 27th of August. I'm Terry Rempel, and we're surprised that we've got another program together. Uh, but we do, so here we are, and we're going to have a look at uh, Utah. We're going to move through Utah, look at um, a little bit of Texas, New Mexico. We've got a couple of discoveries to show you, and uh, that includes one large one in Minnesota. So. Before we begin, all our programs are dedicated to our Heavenly Father's service, so we'll begin with a prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you that we're again able to communicate with your children, um, to show all of, all of those that are led here to watch the warnings that you provide through all of the geologic information that's available. And uh, certainly, you have always warned through your prophets. I'm certainly no prophet, but I uh, want to thank you that you've given me an understanding of all this that I can share. And thank you for all of the warnings that we're getting elsewhere. Um, there's certainly so many things going on. We can see uh, things manifested from the spiritual into the physical, certainly. Um, the war is certainly ongoing and, and getting a lot hotter. Thank you, Jesus, for shepherding us. And we ask that you continue to do this. And Holy Spirit, we ask that you continue to bring the gifts of understanding so that we can all see, have discernment of truth. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're beginning with Camp Tracy today. And this is just a couple of miles east of uh, Murray in Utah, about six, maybe six and a half miles uh, southeast of uh, Salt Lake City. Now, I didn't leave that up for long. I wanted to compare this to the busiest site today in Yellowstone. So this is, uh, this is southeast Yellowstone, um, south of the East Gate. And this is the uh, busiest site for the day, or, or pretty close to it. And we showed them earlier. I think there was one site that was a little busier. And this site in Utah is um, busier than the site in uh, Yellowstone. Very comparable types of activity, but this one's busier in Utah. Utah is busier right now than Yellowstone, any of the Yellowstone sites. I just went through them today. You saw that if you watched the earlier program. South of Riverton, the Tra um, Traverse Mountains show um, this site is located there and it shows uh, magma infill, um, steady magma vibrations on the lines. You don't get vibrations without flows, so there's infill of the Travis, uh, Traverse Mountains. South of Ephraim, the Snow College site is uh, showing only steam burst signals. I think this is quite a turned down site. There's very, very little activity on the baseline. Um, so with it being turned down, the steam signals are, they burst when they're coming up out of the ground. They give a, a little mini explosion that'll shake the ground. And that's why you see stern, steam burst signals like this. And uh, this is every day, pretty much in uh, at Snow College. You don't get that steam release without the magma um, coming coming in um, to bring the water with it. Uh, subduction magma is about 4% water. I'm not sure what the water content is going to be all the way over at Utah. It's probably more like 2%, but uh, it's, it's there in the magma, kept under such intense pressure, so uh, miles down deep in the ground, until it comes up to a level where it depressurizes, the water remains liquid. So there's water in magma. It's uh, under too much pressure to turn into steam. This is an area called Horse Heaven. Now, I have to look and see exactly where that is. It's north of uh, the San Rafael River and south of Humbug Flats. I don't know why they're called Humbug Flats. Sounds like an interesting place. But uh, magma, top of this seismogram, that's a pretty significant magma across the top. Okay, it doesn't have a lot of vertical strikes of um, fault shift. 
We would see uh, vertical strikes as we see down here with the uplift if that was those were uplift tremors. This is straight up magma movement. And here we have a small earthquake. This is a larger one. We're going to see um, a closer site. This is actually a little north of this site where it's that active. Actually, north? No, it's going to be... Uh... Oh, let's see. Let's go there right now. Um, it's over to the east. This is the source of that signal. Okay, so... This is Fish Springs. It's about 13 miles south of the Dugway Proving Grounds, and I believe the uh, lower portion, the Proving Ground portion, is not for ordnance. And this does not have the shape of an ordnance signature or an explosive uh, device. Um, this has a funnel shape coming out of the back end of it, which is uh, not found in explosives. So this is not an explosion. This is an earthquake. And that's in the 4.2 range. We see it also here um, south of Fish Springs at uh, Pine Spring. Pine Spring in Utah. And there are other ones we don't see it at, but it's picked up really well. This is, this is a long ways east. An awfully long ways east. Uh, Horse Heaven is... Um, central Utah picking up a good signal here. There's a lot of tremors on this page as well. This is a well set up site. It's uh, at the correct amplitude. Um, the Curly Ranch is south and east of, um, of the Horse Heaven site and uh, it shows very very significant uplift tremors. That's what these are down at the bottom. They're so large that the uh, computer is marking them off for the um, seismologist's attention. So a lot of fault shift tremors up top, but we're having a deep magma movement. You can see just little bits of it on the line. It doesn't stand out well. And we see associated tremors, but uh, there's significant magma infill down deep to get this level of uplift tremoring. That looks like massive earthquake activity. It's not. It's uplift. Uplift expends its energy upwards. It has to be fairly near the site uh, at the Curly Ranch in order to generate this large of a signal. Henry Mountain is also pretty active. Now you notice Henry Mountain, we're down in the south. We're not picking up that earthquake that's right in this area that we saw up at Horse Heaven and uh, we know it comes from, the, from near Fish Springs. So this didn't propagate well to the south, it propagated well east and west, which gives us an indication of the force direction, and also it gives us an indication of the uh, false direction. This is Little Creek. Little Creek is uh, southwest Utah. And again, down in the south, we're not seeing that large earthquake in here. This may be it right here. Uh, just for argument's sake, we'll have a look and see if it's at the 20, 30, 20, 45 at this point, and 20, 30, 21, 30. So this is a half hour line. So this is 2100 at this point. An odd way to do a seismogram. Um, so it's 2100 and. Um, about 18 minutes, 17 minutes, something like that. We'll see if that matches up. 2100 and no, this is a different signal. So it doesn't show up. Um, this is the Pine Spring site. We're seeing, uh, again, lots of tremor activity. This is an uplift uh, earthquake through here. And we've got constant magma movement uh, with an elevated baseline throughout. Fish Springs does not have the elevated baseline. It has the earthquake instead, and it has some large tremor activity showing from the site. Um, this is the closest one to Fish, um, Fish Springs. These will be further away. You can see a little bit of a P wave. That's at least 50 miles away. Um, this is quite a bit further away.
VLF waves. This now we're in Monahans, Texas, and I just showed this one on the 25th for the VLF waves. There was a similar set down on the bottom of the 23rd, a double set like this. I think it was three waves made. So Monahans, Texas has been very active at times with VLF waves. This is Pecos, Texas, showing lots of small earthquakes and tremors. And we're going to look at the source of those. That's on the 27th. Let's see how this one matches up. Signals are in green on this one. That uh, gives us a, a good indication that it's not a close match. Because these ones... Ah! Yes, they are. They're all in green. So this is picking up, all of these up through here, are being transmitted from the Dagger Draw site. So we'll, uh, we'll be having a look at that in just a moment. So the origin of most of this activity is Dagger Draw. This is propagation from Dagger Draw, showing that these are not uplift earthquakes, but these are small um, tectonic earthquakes, uh, not caused by magma, but rather caused by fault movement. Short and sharp. Short and sharp will give you good propagation. This is Deming on the 24th. And I wanted to show you this, just to show you the, uh, the size of the activity and um, it's, there's fault shift through here, so this is happening on the 24th, but we've got gaps in the larger signals as well. Uh, I believe from looking at these now for a number of months that um, the seismograms are not able to handle the size of the activity when it gets very large and when it's largest is right in the center of the signal. So we have a gap here in the center, we have a gap here in the center, we have a gap here in the center, a big gap here in the center and very likely it's, uh, it's kicking up waves that would be up about this high if they were not clipped waveform signals. Uh, you can see on this one that they're clipped on the bottom. So they're only allowing them to show a, a, to a certain size. And that's normal for some size grounds. So what we see, if we were to fill in the, uh, the gaps, these are very large, um, large tremors, small earthquakes. That's damning. Those should be felt, uh, a few of those would be in the 3.0 range. Deming on the 27th, very large signal through here, that's today of course, and uh, significant gap, again, we'd have uh, waves up to here. But I believe these are uplift, because they taper in, they taper out. And uh, if they were filled in and clipped, they would look very much like the Bombay beach signals, which makes you question, um, are we having magma uplift with these? Um, so is there a localized close um, volcano? Well, we happen to be right on a volcanic trend, so it's very likely. So that's Deming. San Antonio is uh, more prone to fault shift activity. It doesn't show a lot of uh, earthquake activity from this site. Lemitar is not that far away, and here we're seeing some fault shift activity. I saved this one from the 23rd. It's also having some tremors up here. It's having uh, elevated baseline activity throughout the entire seismogram, indicating there, that there's magma involvement um, up the Rio Grande River, which is absolutely logical because the Rio Grande River runs in the Rio Grande Rift. For those that are not aware, that is a spreading center in the U.S., and it's uh, been well identified as such. I happened to run across that information recently, so I'm sharing it with you now. Lemitar fault uh, shift on the 27th, a uh, little shorter in duration, this three hours in total, very significant movement. Rift faults will shift. How about that, eh? San Simon Sink, this is an awful lot of magma vibration activity. Is it real? Is it an elevated baseline? I don't think so. I saw it, uh, I saw it build from when it had very little activity, and I saw it jump to get to this, and it's jumped a few times to get to this 
this level. So I think this is uh, this is true activity in San Simon Sink and a very active volcanic area. Cap Rock, New Mexico, less active than San Simon Sink, but this could be just off to the side and actually be just as busy if we got right over top of the magma channel that would be involved with San Simon Sink. Now San Simon Sink is right in the middle of a whole bunch of oil, oil wells, not a lot of population there. Dagger Draw on the 26th. This is not the one we looked at with all the green signals. That's the next one coming up. But this was already busy on the 26th, and this is a lot of activity. A lot of tremors, small earthquakes, and magma infill throughout. Um, so this is a very, very active site. We're going to have a look at the location of this site in just a minute after we finish looking at today's activity. Very, very significant uh, small earthquakes throughout the page. There's uh, one, two, three, four, at least five reportable uh, 2.0 and greater earthquakes just on this one page. And uh, I doubt very much they're calling this the swarm than it truly is. But Dagger Draw is having earthquakes every day. Um, it's a little slower than Bombay Beach is, but it's certainly having uh, the same, almost the same level of activity all around it from multiple sites. So let's look again at where this is. Um, I just got to have a little bit of the ocean showing here so we can better see where we're located. We're pretty centered in the uh, in the continent. So Pacific on either side we're looking at this trend right here. This is the Rio Grande Rift coming down through here. And it's uh, it's following, in fact, the mountain chain. So the main mountain chain is right up and is is right here. We'll get a little closer look at this. Get closer and closer, and here's Albuquerque. This is um, the Rio Grande Rift here. Um, this is Lamitar, um, Carthage, San Antonio, uh, Socorro is right in the middle of these. All right. Um, Dagger draws over here to the right, but you can see it's not that far off the main trend. So often there are parallel fault sets, and uh, and volcanoes will show up on either side of a fault. That's quite common. So this is a known volcanic area. This is Deming over on this side. And for just in case your phone is smaller, this is Deming. Cornutus Mountains in Texas are here, right in the north border. This is the Guadalupe Mountains down here. Here's Pecos, Monahans. We'll get a little bit closer look, but the names won't be any larger. This is the Valles Caldera up here. We had a 4.2 up here um, on the 7th, uh, 12th day of the 7th month, uh, so 12th of July. And uh, we had another um, five 5.1 down here somewhere as well, um, off the map. So here's uh, Lemitar, this is the uh, Rio Grande Rift, and there's a big volcanic trend right through here. It includes a volcano here, a uh, volcanic field here, volcano there, um, small volcanic field here, and we're going to have a look at that as well. Some new information. Now, I'm sorry I can't make this larger because I tried and it uh, moved me to another program and I'm doing this program I think a third time now so I think I'll just leave it be. There's um, This is the Lemitar Socorro area here. Um, this is the Rio Grande Rift north, north to south and this uh, Socorro magma body is about 84. It's been uh, um, visualized with seismic um, study and it's about 84 cubic uh, miles of magma. Miles? Yeah, 84 cubic miles. Now this is not as big as the Red Hill volcanic field. It's not as big as the San uh, Bandera volcanic field. It's not as large as the Valles Caldera and uh, it's not as large as the uh, Teos Plateau volcanic field or the Halen, um, Halen Clayton volcanic field. So there's a bunch of volcanic fields that are bigger, but this one 
is 1,300 square miles. That's how much volcanic act, um, volcanism there is, and it's active volcanism in uh, New Mexico. Everywhere that we have seismic data for in New Mexico, it's showing that we have very significant um, magma activation. So this is, this is very significant. So this is called the Jimenez liniment, and it's just it's showing the trend of the volcanic activity that runs from south uh, southwest to northeast, and it cuts across the Rio Grande Rift. This is uh, a little bit more of this is uh, the Albuquerque, what are called the Albuquerque uh, volcanoes. This is Vulcan, this is Black Volcano, this is uh, uh, JA Volcano is what they call it. But there's three in a row, and there's more off in the distance up here. New Mexico is actually quite littered with volcanoes. Now we're going to look at something entirely different. This is a bean field collapse near the Red River in Climax, um, Minnesota. Now I haven't looked up Climax, Minnesota myself. Um, myself to know where exactly it is, but this was a sudden occurrence that the farmer came out and his bean field had dropped about two stories, and this is just in the last week. And they're attributing this to um, lack of rainfall, um, drought type conditions, uh, water extraction for irrigation, um, and the, so the geologists are saying, oh, this is just an, uh, um, a a series of events that uh, we could not calculate for that they all combine to create this effect but they're how the geologists are ignoring this is a question for me because this uh, this is an earthquake that uh, occurred on the 15th but this is um, from, let's see, what's the name of this? The Agassiz National Wildlife Res Refuge Site in Minnesota, USA. And this is all fault shift activity. Distant fault shift activity, and it gets larger through here. There was many days of this. Many, many days of this. And this is leading into the same time period when this collapse happened. Now, if it's the Red River, does the Red River run in a fault? as 90% of the major rivers do, as shown by a geologic study. And in the same time period, uh, on the 17th, we had this to the south um, at Ogallala, Nebraska, showing major fault movement to the south. Now that's a couple of states south. You would say that doesn't, that's not pertinent because it's a couple of states south. This is state center Iowa. And it had a move at exactly the same time. VLF, off the chart move, same time of onset as Ogallala, Nebraska. And this is where it's pertinent to be looking at data in bunches, multiple states together or even multiple countries together. Um, looking at the big picture, we can see there's VLF waves off in the distance throughout this, um, throughout this site very significant VLF waves. They just get close enough that they're set off in, VL in very large VLF waves. And we see them smaller down here. The earthquake in the middle is really of no consequence with what data that we're looking at. That's from across the world. Uh, but these VLF waves and all of this lighter VLF, more distant activity, that's fault shift for, um, if we count this up, we're looking at one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, um, plus this section, nine and a half, plus this section, another half. Ten hours out of 24 hours, there's a shifting fault in Minnesota on the 17th, or I mean in uh, Nebraska. Uh, sorry, this is Iowa. Um, and that's very significant. So, ten hours. A uh, fault shift in Iowa um, associated with a big fault shift in Nebraska and associated with a big shift two days earlier in Minnesota. I didn't save all of the data. I don't save all of the data, and this isn't archived uh, for ease of access. 
um, by the USGS. So I, I had some data saved and that's where I pulled it from. Now Sioux Falls, South Dakota is pertinent because it for many days, for weeks actually, has shown distant VLF waves throughout the entire page. And the Red River runs more in South Dakota um, than it does in Minnesota. It hardly gets into Minnesota. So uh, this is very, very significant. So do we really think that we had two stories for a quarter of a mile that we had this broad area of land drop or did we see a fault shift and a little bit of rifting occur that allowed this land to fall? I think the uh, geologists are ignoring um, the red cape in front of the bull and just walking away from the truth here. They don't want the public to know that this there's this level a fault shift going on. There's there's uh, cracks opening up all over the place. There's rifts um, for other reasons in Florida, but uh, there's there's an awful lot in Arizona right now. I could bring pictures of that up as well. Um, so there's different areas that are showing uh, cracks appear. This is just a lot more violent. This is a big one, and I don't relate this. Uh, consider that the Red River and other rivers in a flat plain like this will um, vary their course and not run necessarily. If they started in a fault, um, they're not going to stay on top of it. They're going to wander off to the side and uh, then the fault's going to reactivate wherever it is and uh, will often recreate the channel for the river, especially if there's a rifting involved. So things to consider. Now I hope you've enjoyed tonight's program. Found it informative. Um, some new things to look at. Um, if you like what we're doing, um, share us with your friends and give us a thumbs up on the way out. And we'll close with a blessing. Heavenly Father, we, we just ask that you bless and protect um, all of your children, all of those faithful to you. Uh, there is so much going on. And as we talked about in the beginning, in our beginning prayer, what we're seeing um, with the abandonment overseas of so many citizens of so many countries um, and leaving them with pallets of, uh, of, of paper and with ex many millions of dollars in weaponry, it's just uh, just a great manifestation of evil. The war is, is fought in the spiritual, but we're seeing it manifested in the physical. Uh, this is abandoning women, children, people that have uh, assisted others to do good. And uh, for a short while, evil has triumphed. And so we, we strongly look forward to the time when you can correct these evils, our Heavenly Father, and Jesus as well. May we all move forward with blessings of understanding and continue to be diligent to seek the truth and to have awareness that are, there are very, very many false prophets in these times, just as there were in Jesus' times, just as there were in the times of Jezebel when there was 950 pro false prophets compared to the one that stood for God. So may we all have discernment in these times. In Jesus' name, amen. And we'll look for you next time on Feed My Sheep, Earthquake Reports, and more. Bye.